too, so that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the bio, uh, as it says, I've been a lawyer for about 15 years. Um, I've got a lot of experience in employment law and labor law. I used to work with a firm um, called Heenan Blakey, which doesn't exist anymore, but uh, they did a lot of employment and labor law and um, and uh, and so forth. And then I did a little detour into some graduate studies and stuff, also focused on labor law. Um, but uh, but now I'm on my own in a practice based in Toronto and Ottawa, and I like to help small businesses. And uh, employment law is a big part of that, uh, for sure, especially during the pandemic. And um, it's been a very active field, and a lot of things have changed in the last year. Uh, but a lot of things have stayed the same as well. So uh, hopefully, I'll be able to give you a few just uh, brief comments about uh, about employment law in Canada. I know we've got people probably from various regions in the country. So um, uh, you know, I'll probably try and speak to as much commonality as I can. And um, and yeah, so hopefully I'll be able to some assistance. I look forward to answering some of your questions. I've got the pre-submitted questions here, so uh, I look forward to answering those. And um, yeah, so basically, I will just move right into the material. Uh, essentially, employment law, as most of you know, if you're in business, is um, one of the major issues facing most businesses. Um, it's one of the major costs of doing business. Uh, major legal uh, risks and complexities that arise from taking on someone as an employee or acquiring the status of an employer. Um, a lot of legal uh, you know, headaches can arise if you're the employer. Of course, I started out on the employee side, so it's a, it, it's, there's two sides to the issue, of course, but uh, from the business side of it, um, it's, very, it's very important and it's important to get good advice and to plan things properly, especially when it comes to things like termination and so forth. Uh, but the basic legal framework in Canada is uh, most employment law is at the provincial level. So the first place you would look is the Provincial Employment Standards Act. Uh, usually it's called the Employment Standards Act um, in most provinces. And that just is a kind of a code of minimum standards such as minimum wage, hours of work, um, and, and so forth. And it's just kind of a, minim a floor of, of minimum standards below which uh, employers are not allowed to contract with employees, and that's a key term uh, under the Act because it doesn't include independent contractors. There is a term in employee in uh, employment statutes called dependent contractors, which are people who occupy a middle ground, uh, salespeople sometimes, uh, you know, uh, transportation field workers and so forth uh, that have a, a sort of an arm's length relationship with the business. Um, then, uh, then there's on top of employment standards, there's the common law of employment, which is essentially um, a, a body of rules relating to dismissal and the rights of each party. It's essentially just contract law extended out to, to the employment realm. Um, so that's employment standards. Again, they're confined just to the employment relationship. So if you're thinking about independent contracting, which is a, a, the topic of some of the questions here, it's very common issue uh, that is one of the goals of becoming an in, of having an independent contractor relationship is to simply avoid uh, this kind of legislative framework and the, and the common law as well. Uh, moving into employment agreements that's basically the second uh, the, sort of the part of the presentation here. Um, the employment agreements uh, are sort of the foundation of obviously there's no such thing as employment law without employment agreements. Uh, employment agreements can be verbal can be very very informal uh, it's simply a work for wages uh, bargain um, and or they can be as complex as an executive employment agreement filled with stock options and non and, and covenants and non competition agreements and so forth so uh, the legal definition of an employment agreement covers everything from an informal conversation uh, at lunch uh, about coming to work for somebody uh, written on a napkin up to to a very complex uh, you know multi page employment agreement so and then moving into independent contractors, which is the topic uh, of, of some of the questions. Obviously, you, this is where you would contract for services from somebody rather than a contract of service, which is an employment contract. So the goal is to try to engage the work and, and the skills and talent of other people without uh, in, incurring the, uh, the, the deep commitments, the deep legal commitments that come along with uh, the employment arrangements. So those are the three basic uh, touchstones of our presentation today. That's basically the foundation of employment law in Canada. Um, and I'll be look forward to answering any questions that you may have for sure. Um, and we could certainly move to some of the pre-submitted questions. Um, 
These are both uh, interesting questions because they both pertain to uh, independent contractors. The first one is relating to uh, <clears throat> the application of minimum standards relating to holidays and uh, their length per year for contract workers. Well, the good news is that um, you can set um, any amount of holidays that you like because it's not an employment relationship. You can structure it in any, any kind of um, <clears throat> way that you like. You can certainly um, uh, negotiate a clause that has, um, you know, a, a provision for um, holidays shall be taken uh, by mutual agreement of the parties by a certain uh, scheduled notice in advance. So there's a lot of flexibility in an independent contractor context for uh, setting holidays. There is no uh, minimum standard like there is for employees. Also related, similarly, vacation pay as a standard does not apply. So Again, that's kind of a benefit because vacation pay um, accumulates over time. It can catch people by surprise. Um, you know, a bookkeeper tells you that you suddenly have an amount of vacation pay that's accrued to somebody and is now payable. Um, it can catch you by surprise down the road. So that's one thing that people like to avoid if you're trying to, uh, to, to get out of the realm of uh, employment law. Um, you know, not that employment law is a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not here to say it's a negative thing. It arose for a very positive reason, but it's a, it's a fairly nuanced and balanced statute. So they try to balance the rights of employers and employees throughout. So, so that's basically the, the, the answer to those two questions in terms of that, that, that first one. And I think the second question pertained to, um, yeah, very similar. Um, can you have an indefinite uh, term for a contract? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, similar to an employment agreement, you can have it for a fixed term, uh, for a term that um, renews automatically. Uh, you can have um, optional renewal clauses, any type of variations on that. So that's another benefit to independent contractor contracts is that you can have a, a, a contract that is similarly, essentially an at-will relationship. So you can uh, terminate for any reason, for example, uh, with 90 days notice. Um, and it, it allows uh, either party to just say, okay, thank you very much. I've had enough. I've benefited from this or the benefit is dissipated from this. Uh, I, I'd like to mutually, you know, sometimes there's exit obligations. There's obligations to return property. Uh, there might be obligations of non -con you know, confidentiality, non-competition, non-solicitation that you can build in around your independent contract or contract, but, uh, but definitely you can say this is a contract for three months only um, and then renewable on a month to month basis. You can structure it any way you like. So, so it offers a lot of flexibility for sure. And I guess the larger issue within, I might as well get into it now, uh, when you're dealing with independent contractor contracts, of course the allure is to try and structure every contract as, as an independent contractor. Um, but it's not quite so easy, unfortunately, because the law and, and a court or a judge may come along later and apply a, uh, a common law test used to uh, decide whether a relationship is really an employment relationship or not, based, regardless of whether the parties actually write the words employment in the agreement. Um, and so that's just something to be careful about. Just the mere incantation of the words independent contractor will not always suffice to uh, take you outside the realm of, of employment law. But, um, but if the features of the employment relationship itself, or sorry, the service relationship itself, are, uh, are looks and walks and talks like, a, like an independent contractor relationship, then you will, uh, you will have less risk in that regard. Some of the factors they look at are, um, can the contractor work for other people besides you is one factor. Uh, another factor is uh, how you're paid by the hour, uh, by the piece, by the product. Um, so if you're paid by the hour, it looks a little more like employment. Um, similarly, if you can't work for anybody else, um, then uh, that makes it look a little bit more like employment. So there's always a risk down the line that the other party may come along and say, hey, I was an employee all those years. I want wrongful dismissal. I want notice the same way that an employee would have. Um, and also CRA may come along more importantly and deem that somebody was an employee and ask you to remit withholding taxes, uh, CPP, EI premiums. It can be quite a nightmare. So it's always good to get really good advice before you um, enter into an independent contractor relationship just to be sure that 
the situation that you're setting up will uh, will hold up to scrutiny down the road as an independent contractor relationship. So that's just the caution around all of these all, all of these things because certainly it is the way to go and it's the way that most of you know most of the clients that I have have certainly gone. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that takes us into our uh, open-ended questions. So, I mean, do you want me to read out some of the ones that are coming? Yeah, sure. I can't, <laughs> I can't read them from here, but sure, if you want to read them out, that'd be great. Yeah. So, I mean, again, if people have the option of raising their hand through the reactions, you can ask your question directly to the lawyer and I'll unmute you. But um, if you prefer me just to read them from the chat, you can also drop them there. Um, so let me queue up the first one. All right, so one of them is regarding unpaid internships. I read that they are illegal unless in some cases. Could new businesses onboard unpaid interns if it's catering to their learning plan? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, interning is extremely common in, in, in many, uh, especially creative industries. Um, and uh, it sometimes is also part of a, a college or educational program. I know. Um, you know, in journalism school, for example, uh, newspapers will take on an unpaid intern, we internships to just to get the experience, uh, which is invaluable to somebody starting out. So uh, I don't think there's anything, I, I, I personally do not know of anything illegal about an internship, although I, I wouldn't, you know, um, you know, <laughs> I would want to look at the situation that you're talking about a little more closely before I give you a definitive answer on that. But uh, and there's nothing unlawful about asking someone to come along uh you know come on board with an internship arrangement where um you know their benefit the consideration flowing from you is not monetary it's uh, educational and it's experiential it's helping them build the network so uh, no there's nothing there's no red flag about internship if you have an internship that lasts forever that's a problem probably <laughs> but uh but uh and a true internship should probably last you know uh i don't know i mean six months to nine months to a year, you know, at the very outside, outside certainly no longer than a year. Um, um, but, you know, internships, especially in competitive fields of, of, of um, you know, creative fields, very, very important and, and it's not discouraged at all. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Next one is regarding paying owners slash shareholders. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, can owners act as contractors to the business and get paid that way? If so, what are the pros and cons of this arrangement versus dividends as a form of owner's compensation? Okay, great. Well, great question, and it's very, very common. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of moving parts in the question, so I, I can't, you know, I wouldn't, um, you know, give an ironclad answer. But my immediate thoughts about um, a shareholder also becoming like a founder, becoming an employee of the company. Um, usually, they will find you know, an executive agreement, if they're taking on an executive position with a company, a CFO position. Um, and in that agreement, sometimes it'll speak to, can the executive work for, or do their own company? Can they do their own things? How much time do they have to devote to the corporation? Um, in terms of, is it a good idea? That has many dimensions. Uh, one of them being uh, versus dividends. You're talking about taking income out of the corporation uh, as dividends versus through salary, obviously. Um, the more tax favorable, I'm not a tax expert, obviously, but a tax, a good accountant would probably say that a dividend that qualifies as an eligible dividend, uh, which is a kind of a complicated field of tax, uh, can have a lower tax rate than straight income, employment income would. Uh, so that can be one benefit of just staying as, um, you know, as someone who's, uh, just a founder, but a passive consultant, you know, but there's all kinds of arrangements where uh, a person who's a founding shareholder or is a shareholder um, also has an employment relationship in parallel to their shareholder relationship. Um, and there's no conflict whatsoever in that. Um, if the uh, employment, if the employment relationship is a, a managerial executive position, then you have fiduciary duties that go along with that as well, which uh, are in line with their interest as a shareholder as well so there's no conflict of interest there um it's very common for them to do that but from the standpoint of taxation i think it can be more more beneficial to do dividends and i think from the standpoint of 
uh, complexity of um, separating from the company if, if that happens, you know, got, you know, the, the eventuality happens that the person wants to leave down the road, it can be a lot more difficult to do that if they're already bound in uh, to an employment relationship as well as a shareholders agreement. Whereas if you just have them in the shareholders agreement, then it's a lot less. But yeah, it can be kind of a complex web of, of, of agreements when you're dealing with executives and share, who are also shareholders, but it's quite common and um, there's no um, conflict. It just, it just means these overlapping agreements, basically. Not gotcha. to oversimplify it, but something like that. Gotcha. All right, the sorry, next my one. Is so long. <laughs> I said I'm using up the whole hour and two questions. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. I mean, I will also say that answering legal questions on the fly is obviously not easy. Yeah, I know. So please uh, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. I, yeah. I, I would have to have, have to look at every case individually, you know. With the... Totally. Uh, the next one is just regarding business owner risk. And they're just asking, um, they're just kind of struggling to understand what their risk is when their service is provided by an independent con contractor to their mm -hmm. clients. Mm -hmm. um, hard to know what amount of insurance to have, even though they have their own professional insurance, I'm sure that the company would be named in the lawsuit. Who, uh, who is able yeah. to advise on that, a lawyer or an insurance company? Um, I think, um, you know, both actually could, could, could do that. I think legally speaking, um, you know, obviously the, the, the need for the insurance coverage and the extent of it would depend upon um, the, 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 co the exposure to, to liability. And if you're talking about a professional who's insured um, that, uh, that has liability insurance, e and insurance, then you would be covered up to the limit of that insurance. So for lawyers, it's like a million or, or maybe two million or something. But if, it, if there's a claim that's a joint and several liability claim and it exceeds that cap, um, you know, whether or not it exceeds the cap, uh, you would still want to have excess insurance, I think it's sometimes called, that would, um, you know, have a provision in it that says this doesn't, I'm not an insurance law expert, but provision in it that says something along the lines of um, this shall only take, kick in and, and apply in the event that every other coverage is exhausted first, kind of a can't remember the name of it is, but it's a clause that says other insurance has to be exhausted first. So, um, and so it would be a good idea to find out what the limit of coverage for the professionals that you're contracting with is, and they shouldn't have too much difficulty telling you what that is. And then you go to your insurance person and say, this is what I've been told about the limit. What should I do? Should I buy uh, overflow insurance as sometimes it's called, or just, you know, excess insurance? So, um, and, and that might be something worth doing. You can also build in clauses in your uh, independent contract or contract, uh, indemnity clauses, so that you would be compensated by the contractor if they do an absolutely awful job and uh, ruin your business and cause you to you know, have long-term profit damages you could claim against them. So I think there's ways to build against that risk as well in your own agreement. But in, from insurance as a backstop, you would, probably want to get excess insurance and you want to find out what the cap would be on that for their coverage. Perfect. Um, next question, tossing up Sorry, to you. 15. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to retroactively make a claim for wrongful dismissal? Retroactively, um, meaning after you've resigned, I, I assume you mean after you've resigned, if you have not actually been terminated, uh, yes, you can, um, after the fact, if you have been forced out of your workplace, and not to sound like a billboard on the highway, <laughs> if you've been forced out of your workplace, um, but if you feel like you've been forced out of your job, they've said you've got to work for half the pay now, or you've got to work with this person who's bullying you and, and, and insulting you every day and harassing you and making your life terrible, forcing you out, uh, it happens a lot, and, and the person quits because they just feel like they've got they just can't go back to the workplace. It's toxic. It's poison. So uh, what will happen? There's a claim, something called constructive dismissal, which is saying I was forced out. It was in law equivalent to being fired. So you would use the date of resignation as your date of termination and go forward from there. You can't wait, you know, six, 10 months. I think you would probably have to do it within maybe one or two months probably there's no hard and fast rule there's a two-year limitation period of course after in, in most provinces in ontario at least um on claims in general so 
uh, if you move promptly, if you've suffered an injury in the workplace or you've just been traumatized by something that happens and it only really dawns on you how, how awful you've been treated and so forth, it takes some time after the fact. Uh, yeah, courts have heard um, constructive dismissal about if you quit already. I'm assuming that's the scenario you're, you're, you're thinking of. Yeah, that can happen. Um, gotcha. Yeah. All right, next one is, would limiting the number of weeks of vacation in the contract make the contractor look more like an employee? Interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of different factors in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of catalog of factors that are looked at. And um, I think limit, limiting the number of vacation days in a year could go both ways. In fact, you could see it as, well, they're not an employee, so they don't get vacation. It's up to them to, you know, to get their work done for me as, and, and structure their life as they see fit, that kind of thing. So the absence of a vacation clause itself could say, well, it looks like it's not really an employment relationship. On the other hand, um, you know, not having it could make it look like you're being really oppressive and, you know, um, and, and you're, you're, you're cracking the whip. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It wouldn't necessarily suddenly flip the switch and make it automatically an employment relationship. But um, I, I actually think the opposite in some ways, um, that the lack of a, a vacation clause would would, would make it uh, more likely to, it sounds cold, but it's probably true uh, that the, the lack of a vacation clause would probably make a, a contract more likely to be an independent one. Okay. All right. So this one Restyling might, be, here. <laughs> might be a little complicated, but it's a good question. Mm -hmm. So is there any risk if someone is working for you informally for a period of time, so they have no contract in place? but they make a material contribution to the company slash product, could that individual come back and make a claim for compensation or ownership? Great question. It happens uh, quite a lot. Um, I think the specific scenario you're talking about is where someone has contributed effort, time, work, ideas, so forth, um, through an informal relationship and then sees it take off in a more structured format through through someone else. Uh, there's there's a doctrine called quantum merit. Uh, it's an it's a Latin term. It's an equitable doctrine, uh, and it is possible for someone to come along later if there is no contract in place. If there is no agreement in place, that's pretty key. If someone was just doing it to uh, to help out and contributed something of real value that that can be connected to a subsequent profit you can get what's called a constructive trust um, uh, over, for example, a certain ownership share in a company. Um, constructive trusts are used all over the law, like in, uh, in family law, for example, where there's a farm couple, uh, husband and wife, and, and, and the spouse, the, the wife contributes her labor for 20 years to that farm, doesn't get paid or anything like that. They separate. Courts have imposed a constructive trust on the farm to compensate her for that labor. It's not quite the same, but it's if somebody is working for free and, and working, you know, there's nothing illegal about that, but if there is a subsequent enrichment and, and, and a profitability arising out of it, especially if they give you something that's IP or potentially protected, mm. um, you know, they could want a piece of the action down the road and they could uh, come back and claim a constructive trust or make a claim in quantum merit for, um, you know, just fair, you know, um, someone has taken the benefit of my work and not paid me. And therefore it's just un unfair for that situation to, to stay in a court, court can order the person to, to, to make that payment. So yeah, it can happen. So it's always good to get things in writing wherever possible. Um, you know, although, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because going, going in writing can sometimes dampen trust, you know, and so a lot, a lot of people like to, you know, it, it's a trust building exercise to keep things informal in some sense, but unfortunately, you know, without a written agreement, uh, a person can come back and, and make that kind of claim sometimes. Totally. And it's almost as better to protect all your areas in that situation. I'd assume. Yeah. Awesome. The and and you, you can still be friends. You can still be friends and working together and just do it maybe an email or something like that. It doesn't have to be a lawyer involved. I mean, it's nice to have a lawyer involved, but I mean, um, you know, if things get real, get serious down the road, yeah, you can get the lawyer involved, but uh, you can just mm -hmm. even a, uh, a, a, an email exchange of texts can constitute an agreement for that purpose, I think. Sure. Our next one, 
can you hire a contractor with shares slash small equity as a way of compensation and zero base salary? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, agree, uh, executive agreements and sometimes have uh, clauses that say for the first year uh, until the company gets some institutional funding from, from an external source, they've applied for a huge grant or something, a shred grant or something like that. Um, and, and they'll say for the, you know, because, you know, for the first year you'll be compensated in, in the stock options, you'll join the stock option plan and, um, and, and that will be, it will be an above board agreement. And then after that, after a certain threshold is reached, then you might start taking salary or a more conventional form of con compensation after that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely possible to do that. And um, you can build in rewards in the stock option plans too, in, in preference shares and giving people who, who took a chance on you from the very start, giving them a special preference down the roads or pro rata, all kinds of mechanisms to make sure that they get recognized for their early trust in you, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, what are my obligations when keeping track of hours when working for my business? So I may get paid in retroactively or would it be better just to take shares? Interesting question. Um, uh, I've seen it done both ways where um, someone has um, reached an agreement with the corporation um, to, to uh, compensate themselves retroactively for uh, you know a labor for a certain period of time um, and that can take the form of shares or it can take the form of, of money payment but usually in many cases companies don't have a lot of money sitting around so it's more likely to be, you know, do it in equity um, and uh, and yeah absolutely sweat equity I guess sometimes it's called you know the labor that someone has invested in a company from the beginning uh, as we all do in everything that we do, uh, it, it, and, and when people do it as a group, we do it as a collective. There, there are, um, you know, there are certain benefits that go along with, with investing that kind of time. And you can certainly retroactively structure agreements to say, we have agreed to recognize all this past effort um, in exchange for a certain, you know, market value salary or something along those lines. And if the company has the money, then you can. You know, um, the key thing is keeping track of hours is important, I think, mostly for the CRA, uh, just so that you don't look like you're a company that has no um, records at all. It's, it's, it's good to try and track your hours if you can. Mm -hmm. All right, we are coming up on the final question. We still have quite a bit of time. So if anyone else sure. wants to drop questions in the chat, go yeah. for it. But this one is a scenario. Um, if you are currently an employee for a company that is similar to the type of company slash business you intend to create, and then just in brackets, already have on your own business plan, et cetera, um, and you concurrently engage in business activities for your own company, do you need to, by law, inform your employer, assuming it could be considered a conflict of interest? That's a great question. Um, at a very general 30,000 foot level, you know, um, in terms of the law of a conflict of interest and fiduciary duties, if somebody is an executive or a founder uh, of a company, um, uh, or, you know, there's a, the, the concept of a fiduciary is someone who has to place another person's interest ahead of themselves and they cannot, that's the basic fundamental concept of it. So it can be, you know, someone looking after uh, you know, a, a child or someone, someone vulnerable that needs to be taken care of. So you have responsibilities and a fiduciary in a corporate sense, um, in a company sense, in a business sense, means that you can't engage in any, you know, competing or conflicting opportunities that arise. And one of the key triggers of a fiduciary duty is when you have access to confidential information, customer lists, know-how, you know, just the, the internal workings of the company on top of any IP. Um, if you were to go out and do a competing business, um, you know, whoever this person is that you're talking about, if they were to go out and do this, they would be at a serious risk uh, of, of, of a lawsuit to uh, and an injunction to try and uh, prevent them from going into business. If, on the other hand, the person was just a sort of a maybe a low-level employee, it all depends, but if you're certainly in on the ground floor of a company and you're part of the, 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 the knowledge and talent that goes to build it, then 
you would be vested with obligations to the other people that you started the company with. That's just a general principle. But um, but to go out and to, to conceal that from the employer uh, that you're planning to do that, or um, even if you do it, would be would would trigger a serious bad reaction from the employer probably and um and and not look good down the road so yeah it's a tough call um you know non compete agreements are you know trying to prevent most of that kind of stuff but um you know there's always two sides to every story at the same time so totally they also mentioned that in their employment contract there's no mention of not being allowed to work in a similar field so in that situation, would you recommend them still maybe having like a lawyer review that contract to confirm mm -hmm. or yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And, and especially if you're uh, concerned about, you know, having fiduciary duties attached to your position. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, because the law of fiduciary duties is sort of superimposed on top of contracts. So sometimes you can't, it's not something you can, it's not something that this, this cut and dried where the, the court will say, oh, you, you had a contract, forget the, the law of equity. So you have to be careful. And it's always good to, to discuss it with a lawyer if you have plans on doing something that you're worried might um, come close to the line of one of those clauses. Um, even if you're allowed to work in a competing industry, you may not, you know, if you leave and you do work it, you, they may still come after you. So there's always a risk. Totally. Uh, last question that got dropped in here. Do you recommend that every employee and contractor formally agree to assign all IP rights to the company? Uh, every employee or independent contractor? Um, you know, if I'm the, if I'm the lawyer for that employee or independent contractor, I would say, no, don't do that. <laughs> you know, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't sign that. And it's always a balance because when you're drafting something for someone, you want them to get the deal that they're looking for. There's another person involved on the outside, but you also don't want to recommend to them, you know, give them the other person the noose to hang them with either. So it's a, uh, it's a tough call. I think you, if, if, if somebody does creative work, in an employment relationship, the work made for hire principle itself will usually put that put the property and that product to the employer uh, by default without any agreement. Um, so, uh, so agreements will sometimes specify that, but you don't have to do it. I think if um, if it's one of the terms of a larger agreement that the compensation is good, it, it, there's a lot of benefits to you in other ways. Absolutely, but at the same time, it is a concession. It means that you are giving up all, you know, lifetime rights to that property, uh, to those ideas and so forth. But, um, you know, like everything, it's a, it's a, it's a bargain. It's a back and forth. Awesome. Well, there's no other questions being dropped in there, but if people want to still, you have a little bit of time left. Yeah, sure. Um, there's, there's a bunch of the chat there. I guess I wasn't sure if those were. Oh yeah, no, there's a lot of thank yous coming in right now. You've been oh, are there very, thank very yous? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fantastic. Yeah, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we have a great treat that actually aligns very well with um, employment law. So I didn't know if anyone okay. knows this, but it's actually Employee Appreciation Day tomorrow. And we have an offer that's going till March 15th that you can take 10% off our Good Lawyer Employment Bundle. Um, so you'll get a call with a good lawyer. We'll go over your questions, advise you. Yeah. You'll get customized set of employment policies, customized employment agreement and one round of minor revisions if necessary. So if you think your business is in need of this, please get in contact with our legal concierge and they will uh, manage getting you set up on that one. Um, and then before I get too much further, I think we have one question that got dropped. Sure. Any legal, uh, legally, uh, legally issues if you have two different businesses that share the same business address, PO box. Interesting question. Um, is there anything illegal about doing that? Um, no, not at all. I don't think so. Actually, um, it's it's you know it's pretty common. Um, some people have a PO box and then their home address. So um, you know, yeah, businesses commonly share addresses. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so. you don't need to worry about uh, taxes or anything like that. Well, no, yeah. If you're if you're if you're claiming residence in a place that's that you're not yeah if you're in the bahamas when you're and you haven't you know you, your checks are coming but um yeah Fair. that's just assuming you know that, yeah nothing else assuming uh, <laughs> we have another question that came in sure. asking if you could just speak about uh more about nonprofit companies having volunteers 
unpaid interns are not affiliated with the educational institution. I read that it was illegal. Is this correct? Oh, sorry. Correction. For profit. For profit. For profit. Okay. I mentioned um, unpaid internship. I don't know if volunteers differ or yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it may depend upon the sector. I don't. I'm not. I don't know offhand um, of any specific legal you know, impediments to using interns or volunteers in a business and certainly in nonprofits, it's pretty common. Um, the only risks that would come along with using interns or any kind of work would be um, any kind of occupational health and safety or, uh, you know, liability related to if they got injured or something like that during the during the work they were doing. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, there's, there's not too much regulation of, um, you know, the use of, uh, you know, uh, uh, intern labor there's there's always the the risk that the, you know if somebody's making a systematic use of it to the point where it seems exploitative um which has happened it's certainly not unprecedented uh then someone might go to the ministry of labor and make an employment standards complaint um and, and allege that somebody's really just you know running sweatshops and not actually doing internships so um but unfortunately, yeah, I don't know offhand of any, you know, the, legis the minutia of the legislation and the regulations related to, to uh, the nonprofits or the nonprofit sector related to uh, volunteers. Um, but I, in my experience, I've never really encountered any kind of legal impediment for an employer to use volunteers. Um, you know, again, it depends upon the surrounding circumstances. Like if you're using volunteers to break a strike, probably not a good idea. <laughs> you know, it's probably you're going to get in some other problems under a different statute for doing that. But yeah. Um, but generally speaking, um, there's no impediment to having interns. And again, though, it'd be good to have things in writing as much as you can. Um, and it can be as simple as a one or two page agreement, uh, point form kind of summary of, of what the understanding is. And, and then you go from there. Um, I think it's pretty common um, and it doesn't have to be, you're right, it doesn't have to be in the nonprofit sector, you can do it. Um, newspapers do it all the time, they're for profit. So mm -hmm. um, at least they used to when I went to school. <laughs> awesome, well, the chat is looking awfully quiet. So I think we okay. can probably conclude our AMA today. That's so great. Again, if okay. anyone's interested in using that um, promotion, it's going till March 15th. So you have a little bit of time call our legal concierge to get more information on this deal. And we have a couple more webinars coming up this month. So we have privacy law considerations next week and then a franchise workshop in a couple of weeks as well. So if you are interested in attending any of these, you can contact David at goodlawyer.ca or myself, Katie at goodlawyer.ca. Um, any closing words from you, Tom? No, thank you very much, Katie. It's been fun. Thanks for everyone for, for showing up and listening. And I hope I was able to answer a few questions. Well, again, I'm just so thank you from the whole group. We have a lot of thank yous coming in and not yeah. easy to do um, questions just off the bat, but you are, you used to be a professor, correct? Is yeah, I used to teach a little bit. Yeah, years okay. ago. <laughs> well, then that makes sense. I was like, you are crushing these questions. So great job and thank you yeah, so much. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting field, always changing. So. Thanks everyone for, for everything. Yeah, and I mean, if you guys are interested in booking with um, Tom, I will drop his link right here. So you can speak to him at a 15 minute legal advice session, or if you wanna follow yep. up on other legal questions, feel free to do that. Right. Absolutely. There we go. Well, this has okay. been fun. <laughs> Well, I will close this out. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see right. you all. At Have our a great night, everyone. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>